Good morning to you all. For those of you who I haven't met, my name is Gary Watkins, and I'll be doing the presentation this morning. Um, <clears throat> today's presentation is a little bit about entrepreneurship, things to look out for in your business, and then also in particular, um, uh, what strategies you need to be contemplating in terms of your... Just to kick off with, I'd like to just introduce um, the company to you. Um, Quattro is a group of financial services companies. Each one of the companies is represented by specialists, and each specialist um, specializes in a different aspect of financial services. So just starting from the top, we've got Quattro Life, which is where our financial strategists sit. They collate all the information for clients, personal, business, wills, everything. And we look at the client holistically. So we're not the corner broker who sits and sells you policies um, at six o'clock at night at the kitchen table. We actually are a professional organization. And um, we look at a client holistically and we give a solution or a strategy for that person's business and for their personal um, goals or objectives. In our legal division, we do commercial and law. So anything from shareholders agreements, MRIs, trusts, international structures, local structures, sales of businesses, um, reviews of leases, anything commercially um, legal that you need either done or reviewed, we do within Quattro Legal. Quattro Sure does our short-term insurance. That's for your home, your business, professional indemnity cover, whatever it might be. Quattro Med does medical aid. Our wills company obviously does wills in the States. Our fund managers business runs four unit trust funds that we run ourselves, our own funds that we run for our clients for either cautious, medium risk, high risk or international. Um, and we advise on those and we monitor those and run them on a daily basis. Quattro Investment Brokers runs our pension fund and provident fund administration. So there we look after a company's pension fund. We do the sale of the fund. We do the claims, the withdrawals, the advice, everything for all the staff and for the, um, the, the owners. Foundation Fund Managers, another one of our companies, doesn't uh, carry our brand purely because some competitors also use our services. Um, but Foundation Fund Managers is a stock broking company. So if you would like to own international shares like Apple, Microsoft, and the likes, you'll be able to invest through Foundation Fund Managers. Our offices are based in Amschlanga, and we sit and we tailor make a, a personal um, a share portfolio for you. It's run through a bank based in Switzerland called Swissquote. And if you want any more information on that, we'll obviously share with you. And we also do the foreign exchange purchases for you as well at discounted rates. So what you would normally buy from your bank, if you want to convert your rand into dollars, as an example, you would get them cheaper <laughs> to us than you would if you went to your traditional banks. And the reason for that is, is we buy millions and millions and millions of rands worth of dollars every year, I mean, every month. And based on that, we get a huge rebate, which we can then pass on to the client to save them some money. Um, VARA <clears throat> is our anonymous reporting division. So here, yeah, this is for companies who would call business owners who would like to be more informed about what's actually happening in the company. So things like theft, fraud, planned strikes, whatever it might be, uh, harassment in the, in the organization, you're able to have an anonymous, anonymous reporting platform, not via telephone, it's via an app, and people can report uh, challenges or indiscretions that they have either seen themselves personally, they can submit files, video, audio, whatever you want, and they can communicate with the business, um, but remain completely anonymous. But it allows the business owner then to understand what's going on and mitigate those risks. And then the last one of our um, businesses is Quattro Financial Room. Here we do data analytics. We do sale of businesses again, mergers, acquisitions, listings, delistings, um, normal financial um, uh, um, uh, uh, management accounts, accounting, tax, anything of involving um, numbers and SARS and structure. So Quattro Financial Room is a great um, division of ours to, to have in our, in our armament. All right, just getting on to um, our advice philosophy, I think what's very important to understand is, is that it's not one cap fits all. So if you look at it, firstly, it's uniquely yours. In other words, we sit with you as a strategist and we help design something that fits you. Not, not um, what we think, but what you think. So it's your plan. Personal engagement, obviously, we embrace technology as much as we can in areas to make ourselves 
more efficient and better and make your process um, more, um, more seamless. Uh, financial strategists, as I said, we're not financial, um, we're not insurance salespeople. We actually gather a lot of information and we do a lot more work than what a normal salesperson would just do in terms of being a policy peddler. We, and as we unpack today, you'll start to see a little bit more about what I mean by that. And then also the last thing, which is the most important, is we educate you so that you're able to make the right decisions, that you can make informed decisions. A lot of people don't understand the financial services industry, don't understand business, but they're in business and they need financial services. So our mandate is, is to educate people because if we educate you, you can trust it. If you trust it, you can adopt it or invest into it. But without those uh, two steps prior, the chances are most people will never ever actually fulfill their objectives and never mitigate the risks that stand before them. All right, just getting on to some of the things we're going to discuss today. Unfortunately, we can't do everything because we have a limited time, but just a quick brush stroke. We're going to talk about business protection plans that you can use. Bearing in mind, we're not talking insurance. This is what they do with insurance. This is what to do with business. Okay. What products you can use if you need any, things to look out for, and how to implement correct structure. If you think of the, the way that we do our planning, I want you to think of us as an architect. We design a house for you. We draw, we do the strategy. The bricks and mortar and the tile that you choose, that's all ancillary stuff. You can use your own cash, you can borrow money, you can use insurance. We don't care what you use. But what we try and do is mobilize what you've got already as, that you've created in wealth. We try and mobilize that to help you achieve your objectives for death, disability, retirement, savings, whatever it might be, whatever your goal is. And if there's any shortfalls anywhere, then we discuss those shortfalls and how to address fixing them. And there are many different ways of doing it, either via structure or via insurance or via borrowing money or whatever it might be. So <clears throat> part of our recruitment process, which is very, very important for us as a company, is to try and make sure that the right people are equipped with the right skills. So we sit and look at the personality style of the person and we try to put them into the right positions. And we employ people who have got no industry knowledge in our strategy plan. And we train them to be what we want them to be. So there's no preconceived ideas or notions around what they've learned in the past. There's no bad habits. We all sing to the same hymn book. So just to give an example of some of the processes we go through through our recruitment process. So if you are a problem solving person and you've got people skills, we'll stick you into management. If you've got people skills with a drinking problem, then we'll put you into marketing. <laughs> if you've got a drinking problem and you're heartless, we'll make you an attorney. And if you're OCD and heartless, you'll go straight into HR. And then if you're OCD with math skills, you'll fit into our accounting firm. So that's really how we try and find the right people for the right positions. <clears throat> and for those of you going, I must take a photograph of that because we must use this at work. Please don't. Okay. <coughs> I was just about to take one. <laughs> <laughs> and then the guys that are here today, your strategists, math skills and problem solving, they become your strategists. So that's really how Quattro fits in um, to your life. So I think firstly to understand financial strategy and financial planning is you've got businesses potentially and you've got personal stuff. Most financial people, most insurance people don't understand a thing about business. So they actually don't even discuss it. They just sit down with you and say, right, what do you want? And you say, I need to leave my wife X amount of money or my children or my husband X amount of money. And then they send you a policy and off they go. They earn their commission. You think you've done a great thing. But what you haven't contemplated is when you die, what happens to this business? Who inherits it? What happens to all the staff you employ? What happens to the families that they feed? What's the continuity plan of this business? If you become disabled, how does this business still function? Um, a lot of people think disability is geographical. In other words, the guy says, if I get disabled, I'll work from home. And you go, no, disabled means you can't work, okay? Not, not that you must move offices from um, your building in Pine Town to your, your house in Amschlanga. It means you physically cannot work anymore. You can't do what you need to do. This business is now floundering. So what we do is, is we implement plans that mobilize your business, gives your business continuity, mitigate all the risks, 
and then make that into money, make it into cash that you can then use to try and achieve your objectives. An example would be somebody who says, when I retire, I'm going to sell my business. Okay, we need to contemplate how and to whom and for how much. So those are the types of, of processes we'll go through and it will be in our discussion today. And then if there are any shortfalls, currently, we fill those shortfalls until such time as you've achieved your objective with your own money. So as an example, let's say I've got a business that's worth 3 million Rand and my requirement for my family is 10 million and I can't find any money anywhere else. I'll then borrow 7 million Rand from an insurer. I'll pay them a premium monthly and they'll guarantee me 7 million in cash with my 3 million business that's been liquidated to achieve my objective of 10. If my business now grows to 6 million on my review, I now only need to borrow 4 million from the insurer. So I'll reduce my insurance. And when your business is worth 12 million and you only need 10, you don't need insurance anymore. In fact, you'll have more than you need. Okay. So it's part of a process. And what's very important is, is an annual review. When your advisor phones you annually for a review, most clients go, oh, no, I don't want to spend any more money. Our review is not for you to spend more money. It's to reevaluate what you're trying to achieve. And sometimes, in most cases, you might need less insurance. So there's actually a saving of money. And then that premium that you save will reallocate towards areas where you are still short. Perhaps it's savings for retirement or whatever it might be. Also, just remember, our advisors are highly skilled. When they phone you for a review, we know your objectives and your objections already. We plan for them. Okay, we know that it's, I'm too busy. I don't have any money. Um, I've got another advisor. So we've got... We've got something for a reply anyway. So don't argue with us, just, just see us, okay? Because we will win, okay? <coughs> we, we find prepared. All right, but a, a review is very important. Also, a lot of people, when they're saving money, it's on a debit order. And because it's on a debit order, you think, well, it's fine. Why? Why is a debit order fine? Maybe your money is in the wrong place. Maybe it's not growing the way you need it to grow. That's what the review's about. Things have changed. We've got a Ukrainian war on the go at the moment. Things have changed. If it's no, great, off we go. If it's yes, what? All right, so the things that we look at. Firstly, if you're a business owner, your memorandum of incorporation, which is your founding statement for your business, very important. Every business has a memorandum of incorporation. In 2013, introduced the New Companies Act, and you were given three years in which to change from your association agreements or shareholder agreement that you had. You had to have an MOI. Now, most people went along to their accountant or their lawyer and said, I need to tick that box for MOI. Um, one of my uh, clients two weeks ago said it's called a MOI. They call it the MOI. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so they went along and got the cheapest MOI they could, which is just literally a copy and paste that refers to the Companies Act. Now, the review of the Companies Act was actually designed to protect minority shareholders. But there are a lot of things that are missing in an MOI. One of them being preemptive rights. Have any of you heard of preemptive rights before? Okay, preemptive rights, George Horsica and myself, we're in business together. George wants to sell the shares. Because I've got preemptive rights, it means he has to offer the shares to me first. And then if I refuse, he can then sell to a third party. Okay, if the third party, Ellen, is the buyer and there's a counter offer, so George says, I want five billion for my shares, I say no. He can go to Ellen and offer them to Ellen for five. Ellen says, no, I'll give you three. George has to come back to me and say, I've got an offer for three. Do you want to take them for three? I can say yes or no. If I say no, then he can sell to Ellen. But he always has to come back to me. So it protects the remaining shareholders from inheriting a new partner. In the absence of preemptive rights, it means George can go to Ellen and sell for three, and suddenly he's my new business partner. And I've never met the guy in my life before. We might hate each other. He might be my competitor. I don't know. So preemptive rights is very important. In the standard MOR, there are no preemptive rights. So everybody who's got a standard MOR, currently you have no preemptive rights. Your partner can sell the shares to your competitor tomorrow or your, his granny or the SPCA and they'll become a new business partner. You have to amend your MOR to include preemptive rights. They do mention preemptive rights, but that's only if the company issues additional shares. So the, the company normally, when you start it, would form normally 100 shares would be issued. 
and the two partners would get half of the shares each, 50 shares for George, 50 shares for Gary. Now they bring on a black empowerment partner or a new investor, whatever it might be, and they don't want to sell shares because they're going to pay capital gains tax. So the company issues its own shares, another 50 shares are issued. Now there's 150 shares that are now available, and those issued shares, the other 50, the new buyer buys. And he uses the purchase price to put into the company as share capital. Okay, now he's a third shareholder. There's 150 shares, we all own 50 50 each. The 30 percent shareholder preemptive rights applies to that new buyer only, not to the first two. So you have to review that document. Now, part of our process before we do anything with you from a financial planning perspective is to make sure that that is done correctly in your MRR because that document there takes precedent over any other agreement you have in place. If there's conflict between the two agreements, the MOR will stand. The next one you have is a shareholders agreement. This is a private document. The MOI is not. The MOI is a public document. I can get that at any stage. It's registered at the deeds offices. I can pull an MOR from SIPC. I can have a look and see who the directors are. I can check what you've done. I can see valuation methods. I can see anything you've stuck into your MOR that you've contemplated. So we want to take all the private things out because it's public. We would rather list those in a private document called a shareholders agreement. This now governs the relationship between the shareholders. So if the business needs funding, let's say the business needs 5 million Rand injection to buy new machinery, which will take the business to the next level. Okay. And Alan hasn't got the money to pay. What happens to the business? The business can't grow any bigger than the poorest shareholder can fund. So now we're stuck. We just can't grow. So what we do in the shareholders screen is to say, all right, shareholder number A, or shareholder A, I should say, can fund the five million on his own. But how does it compromise shareholder B? And how does it incentivize shareholder A for doing it? Because shareholder B is now going to benefit from the growth of the business, but he hasn't put his money on the line and any risk. So we want to make sure that the business can grow, but make sure that the relationship is governed correctly. Meetings, a quorum. If there's five shareholders and the one shareholder has 95% and the other four shareholders hold the other four and the other five percent between them, is a quorum for a meeting a show of hands or represented by your percentage shareholder? Some shareholders' agreements refer to a show of hands. So you've got Six shareholders in total, one shareholder only 95%, the other five only 5%. With a show of hands, those minority shareholders can have a meeting. A quorum is now set, and 51% of them can vote, which affects the 95% shareholder. If you that person, it's something you probably don't want. So we need to contemplate who needs to be present. What percentage votes need to be um, 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 represented in order to make decisions, whether they're material decisions or not. So the shareholder agreement will deal with that. The shareholder agreement will deal with a voluntary exit. Remember, there's two types of exits on a business. When you have an involuntary or a voluntary exit. A voluntary exit is, I'm retiring at 65. It's vol I'm volunteering to retire. Okay, Or I'm selling my shares. I'm tired of that business. I want to do something completely different. Okay. Involuntary sales are things like death and disability. We didn't choose it, it just happened. There could be a different valuation method applied to both. To give an example, George and I are in business together, but George is actually the brain brainchild. This business actually revolves around his ideas, his concepts, and his IP. If he leaves the business, I'm not going to pay him full value because I'm actually losing what I've invested in. I bought that jockey. He has got a resource or he's got a skill that I don't have. And the business relies on that skill. So if that skill leaves, the business becomes worthless. So you can have an involuntary sale with a different valuation that's penal. So the person decides not to sell so that the business can retain its value. A voluntary sale um, could be things like, when I retire, I would like to still get fair value. Okay, because the person is retiring, there's no malice, um, there's no misconduct, there's no fraud, there's no nothing. The guys just reach retirement age. 
you can contemplate that in your share agreement. Your valuation for the sale of the business to a third party would be willing buyer, willing seller. The buyer would approach you to buy your business, you would agree on the sale, and you would sell. If you've got a minority shareholder, you don't want the minority shareholder to stop the sale from taking place. So you would have come along, tag along clauses in to say that if I sell my business uh, for X, you must either buy me out for that value or you must come along for that sale and sell as well. Okay. Or they can tag along. So they can say, if you sell, I will. I want to be part of that. I can't have my major shareholder selling and suddenly I've got a big new shareholder and I'm a minority shareholder and I don't like them. So you have those types of clauses inside there as well. And that's kept in the drawer. It's like your Bible. It's got the Ten Commandments in it. And you don't touch it until there's a boxing match. But you have to have one in place. We deal with so many fights between business partners because they haven't got those things in place. Just bear in mind, as I said, if this agreement conflicts with that one, this one will take precedent. Then the last one is your buy and sell. Deals with involuntary sale, death and disability only. It's a separate agreement completely, and the reason for that is buy and sell is reviewed regularly. Okay? Why well, I mean regularly? If there's a change in shareholding percentages or a new shareholder that joins, the old buy and sell agreement becomes not important. Then it's a drop a new one. The value of the business needs to be reviewed every year. Could go up, could go down, could stay the same, but you've got a valuation statement. You've got to update that valuation every single year to make sure that it's current. All right, so that's what's called a living document. And again, that document there cannot conflict with this one here, which cannot conflict with that one there. Otherwise, this one will take precedence again. All right, so those are the orders. So that's on the legal due diligence side. And we go through that process for you as a client and show you the roadblocks, if there are any, and how to mitigate those risks and fix it. So the protection plans that we normally contemplate for business owners, these are the main ones. Buy and sell, contingent liability, key man, staff retention, and exit strategy. What we always say to a business owner when they start a business is to contemplate the exit first. Think of business like a marriage. What's the first thing you do when you get married? You have an A and C. <laughs> you sign an anti-nuptial contract which deals with the dissolution of the marriage, the breakup. Okay. Likewise, with a business, you need to contemplate your exit. How are you going to exit on death, disability, voluntary, and also use this business for your retirement purposes? <clears throat> All right, so let's look at continuity planning. We'll start with buy and sell. Buy and sell is not an insurance policy. A lot of people we see, we say to them, have you got buy and sell? Yes, we have. Please, can you give us the documentation you'd like to go through it? And they give you policy prints on the business partner's lives. A policy prints is just a financing vehicle. The policy is just finances a transaction. The buy and sell is actually an agreement that says, when Bob dies, Derek will buy. There's no preemptive rights. Remember the preemptive rights. If George wants to sell his shares to Alan, he has to offer them to me first. I have an option to refuse or to buy. That's an option. I don't have to buy. This makes it a compulsion to buy. This says if George dies, I have to buy him out. Okay? And the reason we do that is just because George, in his financial plan, he needs 10 million for his wife, and he knows his shares are worth 3 million. He wants to make sure 3 million hits his estate because he's got personal cover to top up the difference of seven. But if he doesn't know that three million is going to hit his estate, he has to have a whole 10 million life cover for his wife in case he gets nothing. Because where the problem comes in is if there's a preemptive right and he dies and no buy and sell, his executor will come to me to say, I would like you to buy the shares for five million. And I'll say, I'm sorry, it's not worth five million. Man. Okay, George was the main guy. So he goes to Alan and says, Alan, will you buy? Alan says, Yes, I'll buy for three. He comes back to the his executor comes back to me and says, Right, buy for three. I say, I won't buy for three. I'm not prepared to buy for three. I'll pay you 500000 He says, well, then Alan becomes a new shareholder. Perfect. Let's have a meeting with Alan. I sit with Alan for 20 minutes, scared the living bejesus out of him. He runs away with his tail between his legs and says, I'm not investing any money anywhere near that old Gary. He is flipping loopy. And he runs. Now the executors got shares that are literally worth nothing. No third party will buy because of hostility. I end up getting the company for virtually nothing. This family end up suffering financial loss. All because you didn't have an agreement in place. 
The same applies to disability. You get disabled, you cannot do your job. You need to be um, de-risked, get rid of your business because you are liable if you are in a business and you're disabled, so you're incapable of actually performing your duties or being a director or whatever it might be. You're sitting in bed, sucking on a straw. Your wife or husband's busy wiping your bottom every five minutes and you're in a nappy and you've got this business running. You're not earning a salary because you're not employed anymore. You rely solely on dividends. The remaining shareholder is doing all the work. So they increase their salary, reduce dividends, and the disabled family is going, well, where's the money? And the person who's running the business says, well, sorry, I'm doing all the work. I want, I want all the money. There is, no, there is no profit. There is no dividend. Now, why have a share in a business that's not producing a dividend? If you're not getting a return on your investment, why do you own it? Rather take the 3 million rand or whatever the share's worth and invest the money somewhere else where you can get a return and you can live off of it. Okay. So we refer to disabilities as a living death. The buy and sell also gives a value, a valuation method, and a payment plan. Very, very important. When I die or get disabled, I need to know up front how much I'm getting for the business. I can't have an agreement that the auditor will value the business on my death. Because when you're dead, the auditor's working for me. And the auditor can use one of five different valuation methods. He could say, let's use the net asset value. It's only 300,000. Or let's use a PE of five or a PE of three. Uh, what am I getting? Well, the, the buyer, me, and the accountant is going to sit together and say, well, what's the best valuation method that, for me? Because I'm paying you. So he'll come with the best valuation method. So you need to know up front that the valuation method is documented or the value is documented. So either three times earnings, okay, before or after tax, five times earnings before or after tax, whatever it might be, or net asset value, would you agree upon, or a value that's agreed upon to say, the business to me is worth 10 million bucks. I want five, you're going to get five. When we sign and we agree on that value, then we sort it. But you've got to document that. And then the payment plan, are you paying me one rand a month or am I getting my money up front in cash? I need to know that because my family is dependent on the money and so am I if I get disabled. Now we get to the pricing. So this is where the agreement stops now. Now we need to start saying, how are we going to fund it? If I'm buying George's shares for 5 million rand, I'm a shareholder. Where am I going to get 5 million from? I can earn it, but I'd have to earn 8 million pay 3 million rand of my earnings to SARS and tax to net five to pay George. So now I've got to spend a long time working my butt off to find an extra 8 million rand of earnings, not 8 million in earnings, an additional 8 million rand, because I still need to live. An additional eight to pay SARS three just to buy them out. Well, that's not really palatable for me. The other option is I can borrow money from the bank. The bank will charge me an interest rate let's say at prime. So now I'm going to be paying seven, seven and a half percent interest on top of the purchase price to pay George out. It's ludicrous. It's expensive. I could put it on my bond if I wanted to at prime minus one or two or whatever your bond rate is. And I could pay it off over 20 years, but I'm still paying all the interest. Or I can just insure George. And the insurance on George's life would be about 1% of the value. That's far cheaper. 1% in total. That includes interest and capital. Just 1%. If you borrow from the bank, you're paying 7% interest plus the capital. But I can insure George for 1% of the value. It's easy for me to do. It's affordable for me to do. And that's why people use insurance. It just funds the transaction and makes it simple. Now, when George dies, the insurer guarantees me the five million tax-free money, which I then use to purchase the share from the executor, and the executor gives me the shares, and I, now I own the company. Clean as a whistle. Simple process. So we've got the agreement funded by an insurance policy, potentially, unless you want to pay cash, it's up to you. And then the last thing is just to make sure that the partners pay each other's policies, not your own. So I will insure George, I will own that policy, I'm the beneficiary of it, and I'm the payer. George will own a policy on my life, he's the payer, 
he's the beneficiary and he's the owner. If I pay one cent of the policy that George owns on my life, just one, one cent, SARS will take 20% of that as a state duty. So then George would be left with a shortfall of a million bucks. You get the five million, there's 20% to SARS, and you only have four million left over to do the purchase, you'd be short a million rand. So we want to make sure that the structure of the agreement's right, and then make sure that the structure of the policies are correct, and the premiums are paid correctly to avoid the state duty. All right, is that pretty simple, eh? So the things to look out for, for buy and sell, estate duty, very important. What benefits are on the policy? We're only dealing with death and disability, nothing else. If you've got dread disease cover on there, it's wrong. If you've got income protection on there, it's wrong. If you've got anything else on there, it's wrong. Just death and disability, finished in plot. Be very careful of disability definitions, guys. You get different types of disabilities. You get permanent disabilities, you get temporary disabilities. If I'm off work for six months, I'm not selling my business. If I lose my pinky finger, there's a benefit that pays out for the loss of the pinky finger. But I'm not going to sell my business because I lost my pinky finger. Because I can still do my job. Unless my job is to do this, <laughs> then obviously I have to sell. Okay? But if my job's just to, like what I'm doing now, if I don't have a pinky finger, it doesn't really matter. So I'm not going to sell my business because of a loss of, of, a, of a limb or loss of use of a limb. Now, um, another very important part is terminal illness. If you are diagnosed to die within 12 months, the doctor says, have a seat. You know, what, you know. I've got good news and bad news. Which one would you like first? Give me the bad news. Okay, you're going to die in 12 months. But the good news is your insurance will pay up early. Your insurance will actually pay you out before you die. So you can sort out all your affairs before death. It helps a hell of a lot. The problem is it also pays out in your buy and sell. So now I'm terminally ill. I'm going to die in 12 months. George gets paid 5 million rand in cash on the policy that he owns on my life. But I'm not dead, so he doesn't have to buy my shares. I'm not disabled. He doesn't have to buy my shares. I'm just dying. Takes the money, opens up next door, has a big fat jaw, and never, ever, ever concludes the buy and sell with me. Resides from the company as a shareholder, leaves me the shares. My state can't deal with it. My family can't deal with the business. They know nothing about it. And he walks away. So we've got to contemplate terminal illness in your agreement. Preemptive rights, we spoke about ad nauseum. Repudiation of claims. If your client lied, or if your client, your business partner, lied, sorry, your business partner lied on the application form, so he forgot to mention that he had lung cancer two years ago. The insurer issues the policy. The guy dies. The insurer picks up non-disclosure and repudiates the claim. Your agreement forces you to buy, but you haven't got money. So now you're really stuck. You've got to come up with five million rand in cash, and you haven't got one cent provision to pay for it. What do you do? You contemplate that in the buy and sell agreement. Expiration of risk benefits. For example, disability expires when you're 65. What happens if you're still in business at 66 and you get disabled? How do we deal with that? So you've still got a compulsion to buy the share, but no funding mechanism in place to finance it. And then the big one, guys, if you have got your shares owned by another company or your shares owned by a hold co owned by a trust or your shares held by your trust directly, that complicates the agreement significantly. We specialize in this space so we can deal with it, but it changes the way that your agreements are structured significantly. We see this particularly with businesses that are requiring black empowerment companies to be shareholders. So you've got a company, ABC Co., and they have to have a 30% BEE um, um, ownership. There's a black empowerment company called BEE Co., and BEE Co. buy 30% of your business. But BEE Co. is a company. Okay? A company can't die. You with me? But there's a representative of the company who you like. Okay? His name's Bob. Okay? And he owns BEE Co. And he is actually the guy that you're in business with. But his shares are held by this black empowerment company. If Bob dies, we don't want Bob to leave this black empowerment company to his white friend 
because now it's not BE anymore. So we've got to make sure that we can control the ownership of that BE eco. What's going to happen if there's a change of control and ownership? If Bob dies, what happens to BE eco? I need to know what his will says. I've got to have an agreement that deals with that to say, Bob, you can't sell your BE eco without notifying me. If you do, then I have the right to purchase the shares of ABC, our business, back from BE eco. I would have then find another Black and Cowan partner. Okay, but you don't inherit a partner. That is the biggest oversight we find in nearly every single structure we see. All right, the types of disability, I've just included this slide because it's very important to understand. I don't like dropping names or dissing other insurance companies because it's not professional. So we don't like taking any liberties at all. Okay. But during our research, which has taken us a while, in fact, some of our research is quite old, but we mutually agreed that it worked. We discovered, discovered sorry, some very important nuances in the definition of disability. And these are the different types. The first one is income protector. That pays on temporary disability. As a business owner, if you can't work anymore, you need your salary. That's the first policy you have to buy. You have to have an income to sustain you and your family. If you don't have income protection in place, you will lose your house. You will lose your car. You will lose the school fees you're able to pay. You'll lose your medical aid. You have no money coming in, all your expenses, and you cannot operate. When you finally are rehabilitated after your sequestration or liquidation, Five years later, you can reapply to try and get finance again. But if you fall off the perch because of cancer, heart disease, car crash, slip down the stairs, whatever, and you off work for a year and your business closes, what happens when you come back to work in a year's time? What do you come back to? Your business has got overheads that it needs to cover. Lights, water, rent, staff salaries, etc. If you off work for a year and you can't operate and this business starts to implode, do you want all the staff to resign and leave and go work for other companies and other jobs and you come back to a shell? None of your creditors are being paid. None of your debtors are being collected because everyone's buggered off. And you literally are destitute. So you will need a personal income protection policy and you might need one for the company as well to sustain the shortfall in the overheads, the risk portion of the overheads that might not be covered while you offset. Now, temporary disability is the most probable thing to happen in your life. Yet everybody has lump sum disability in their plans only. Hardly anyone we see as income protector. How many, honestly, disabled persons do you know in your life personally? Well, permanently disabled, like front, as opposed to how many people you know, okay? It's a minority, a tiny percentage, unless you work in a disabled type, of course, that you'll know a lot, okay? But if you work, just average Joe, you will not know many people who are permanently disabled. But now think back how many people you know that have been off work. A woman has a hysterectomy, she's off work for a month and a half. Um, you have someone has a car crash and breaks their legs and they're in traction or in hospital with pins for, for six weeks or eight weeks or six months. My father-in-law had cancer. He's an advocate. He was off work for 13 months. 13 months, no work. He only earns what he does. He was doing nothing. No lawyers would employ him because they didn't know whether he'd be feeling well that day because he was on chemotherapy. He had no income for 13 months. Luckily, he had income protector. Paid him a salary while he was off work. He was able to still continue living. There was a guy who was a one-man bucket brigade, builder, renovator, whatever. It was December. I think it was about five or six years ago. His name is Mike. Now, never forget him. Offered him income protector. He declined it. That December, he was driving from the shop to his house. They went to go buy some booze. About 600 meters from his house, his bucky went off the side of the road in a tree. He broke his leg. Couldn't work for like six weeks. Had to go back to the doctors again. And then they'd operate on him and put a pin in all the bits and pieces inside his leg. And he was off work for like five, six months afterwards. Then nothing. Bucky gone, everything gone. Nothing at all. In fact, I lent him money, which he still hasn't paid me back. 
So if anyone wants to borrow 30 grand, mark Nell. Okay. <laughs> you can have it for free. Okay. But that's it's a very important component. Impairment. This is something you do not have in your buy and sell. This is where it covers a loss of a limb or a loss of a limb, a pinky finger, a thumb, a hand, a leg, a foot, whatever it might be. It pays out a percentage of the benefit. But if you're not going to sell your business because you lost your finger, then you don't have impairment cover in place. Then you've got occupational disability. This is where it starts to sound a little bit better because now it's relating to your ability to do your job. Remember, you need money when you can't work anymore because you can't earn anymore. That's what you need. So occupational disability pays out if you can't do your job. The problem is the fine print. Because what it actually reads is, they will only admit a claim if, by your training, status, knowledge, or ability, you cannot perform your occupation, or a similar occupation, or a reasonable occupation, at the sole discretion of the insurer. So you can do something else. So I'm a surgeon. I can't be a surgeon anymore. Can I lecture? Yes, it's similar. It is. It's reasonable. Yes, you can earn. Yes, off you go. Okay, I'm a GP now. Was a surgeon earning eight million. Now I'm a GP earning eight hundred thousand. Not good. Okay, the fine print here will bite a lot of people in the bum. The one that we use is called own occupational disability, not just occupational. The big thing is own. What do I do in this room? Raise your hands if you get arthritis in your your dominant hand. Can you still do your job? Raise your hand if you can still do your job with arthritis in your dominant hand. Okay. Now, think of your job and you are a cardiac thoracic surgeon. You perform surgery on little arteries that are this thick and you get arthritis in that same hand. Can you still do your job? No. So arthritis is not actually a disability claim event. But arthritis is in certain occupations. So what we've got to do is look at not just the condition to see if it's a disability, but that condition applied to your specific job. You with me? So that's why you need own occupational disability, because they're going to, you're going to write what you do as a living in there. And they're going to cover that ability to do that. We had a doctor client many years ago. He had PPS insurance. He stopped being a doctor. He bought a farm and he started farming in Greeny Cows. He never notified the insurer of this change of occupation. He got disabled. The insurer repudiated the claim because he could still be a doctor and he was insured as a doctor, but he could not be a farmer anymore. And that was his occupation. Very, very important. And then the other one is called comprehensive disability. This is the Rolls Royce of disability. This would belong on your personal insurance, never on your buy and sell, because this Rolls Royce covers own occupational disability, but it also covers this impairment stuff. And you don't want impairment there either. So even though this is the best benefit, it's the worst benefit to have, or one of the worst benefits to have on a buy and sell. Okay. So results of no agreement, your, su your surviving partner could trade the business down to nothing. No, part, no third party might purchase your business because of hostility. Your family will get less than the actual value. Your competitor might become your new business partner. Your ex-wife's family, um, kids and stuff, might become your ex uh, partners or the trustees, if there's a trust involved, could become your partners. Guys, I want to also just say to you, if you've got a buy and sell policy in place with no agreements, you're better off cancelling the, the policy than you are having it. If George and I have a policy on each other's life for 10 million each and no agreements, when I die, George gets 10 million rand in cash. That's all that happens. He doesn't have to buy my shares. There's no agreement to compel him to buy. He just gets 10 bar in cash. He can take the 10 bar and go buy himself a flipping place in Camps Bay if he wants to. Now, my wife and executive come along to him and say, hey, you're going to buy the shares in ABC Co. And he says, no, nah, what for? Don't be bothered. Willing buyer, willing seller. I'll give you asset value, 200 grand, second hand furniture. And then comes along, hostility. My family end up getting nothing. He gets 10 bar, he gets a free beach cottage. What's worse is my family will be liable for the estate duty. 
on that policy because he's not using it for buy and sell, so it doesn't qualify for the state duty exemption. So my wife and kids would have to lose two million rand of their money plus the 10 million. That two million of their money goes to SARS immediately. George gets 10 bar tax free. My family have lost two million, and that would normally be from the sale of an asset, cars, house, whatever. They've lost two million. Now they have to try and sue George civilly, not criminally, civilly, to try and get the money back. That can take years. It will lead to your estate being declared and sold potentially. So be very, very careful of that. All right, sureties. This is a very simple topic. People borrow money for their businesses in order to raise finance to purchase assets, raise finance to purchase buildings, whatever it might be, overdraft facilities. When you need to borrow money, the bank are going to ask you to sign a personal surety. The normal sureties that you would see, the wording would be joint and several surety, co principal debtor, unlimited surety, et cetera, et cetera. Just to explain in layman's terms, George, Gary, and Alan buy a building together. It's worth 10 million rand. We need to put down a deposit of, a, of 3 million and bond seven. So he puts a million, he puts a million, I put a million. We put that money in as a deposit in the company, and the company borrows 7 million rand on a bond. Because we've signed co principal debtor and jointly and separately, it means the bank can come to the company or George or me or Alan, any one of us. To get the whole seven million, we're jointly and severally liable as co-principal debtors, as individual personal sureties. So we all are liable for the full seven million each. So if I die, there's nothing stopping the bank now going straight from um, the business straight to my estate and just taking the money out of my estate, the whole seven million, settling the bond. They do the buy and sell, and they buy me out for my net asset value. I've only got a million rand in equity in there. Remember, the property is worth 10, but it's bonded seven. It's only worth three net value. My third is one million. So I get a million bucks for my buy and sell, but that takes seven million for my estate to go and settle the debt. So we minus six million in my estate, and they've got a property company that's debt free that's worth 10 bucks just because of that surety. Now, the property might be a commercial one where there's rent being paid in by tenants. So there's an argument that most business owners say. They say, rubbish. As long as we keep servicing the debt, the bank won't come and take the money from us. So we say, cool. We don't argue with you. Let's ask the bank. So we go to the bank, phone the bank manager up and say, right, listen, will you come and take the full seven million? Absolutely not. Gary's kids and my kids go to the same school. We best mates, we bride together. You sort it, you fine, because I've got a great relationship with my bank manager. So fantastic. Please, Mr. Bank Manager, can you give that to us in writing? And that's where the discussion stops. The bank will not give it to you in writing that they won't come to your estate. Because they've got it in writing that they will and that they can. You with me? Okay, so we're be very, very careful around those sureties. If you've signed personal surety, what you've said is you can come and take the lily white money and all my assets in lieu of that debt. The bank can take the money from you whenever they perceive there to be a change in risk. When we applied for that bond, we had to provide them with the company's financials, our personal income, our personal assets, balance sheets, in order to obtain that loan. The reason being is the loan was granted on the strength of all three of us. If one of us are out the picture, the risk changes. You know, during COVID, when people weren't dead, Banks were going to people and saying, right, one of my best friends, his overdraft facility in his business was six million. The bank was EPSA. They wrote to him during COVID because he couldn't work and said, we're reducing your facility by two million rand right now. Your OD will be four million. We need two million, please. He had a fine, two million bucks to settle it. And then they reduced it by a further 500,000 a month, every single month because they perceived COVID to be a risk to their business, and the bank manager wanted to protect his own house. Finished and done. So the only way to mitigate it now is to cover it, reinsure it. So the company will take out a policy of George's life, my life, and Alan's life for 7 million. Each, they've got 20 million rands worth of life cover to cover one bond for 7 million. 
It's disgusting. But we've all signed that they can take the money from us. So we've got to have the insurance in place, but we don't know who's going to die or get disabled first. So we all have to have the same cover. Now we're paying a fortune in premium. So what you do is you go to your bank and you negotiate and say, right, I'm a third shareholder. I want to limit my surety to my percentage ownership. I only own 33%. I'm signing for 32% of the debt. That's it. You limit your surety. If the bank are prepared to grant you that, then you only need one third of the 7 million each. But if the bank will not grant you that, guys, you have to have 7 million rands worth of cover on your life to cover that debt. And that it's not a debate, it's in writing. The only time the, the debate ends is if they revoke that surety. If they waive the surety, then you're fine. But you have to have it in writing. People say that they um, don't want to cover their liability. They don't want to take the insurance. Guys, understand, you've already accepted the, the, the liability. You signed for it. You said, I've earned this. I bought a house. It's worth 5 million rand. I've got a ski boat worth 500,000 and I've got 10 cars. When I die or get disabled, or if the risk changes for you, you can have all of this stuff to cover that 7 million. That's what a personal surety is. You're giving them your personal assets. All we're doing is we're saying, hold on. These assets are yours that you've earned and you had to pay tax on to get. Let's protect them by putting a surety ship protection plan in place. And then you need an agreement that's drafted at the end to compel the shareholders that are left to settle the debt. Because what happens is I die, the 7 million hits the company's accounts. There's no compulsion for them to use the money to settle the bond. The banks still go to my state because the contract's between me and the bank. Not between the business and the bank, between me and the bank, personal surety. The bank still can wipe out my estate. These guys get seven million paid into the company and they draw it out as loan accounts and bonuses. So you've got to have an agreement that says when the policy pays, it has to be used to settle that facility and release my estate from its surety obligation. But without the agreement, guys, you may as well have the policy. All you're doing is enriching your partner and create, creating an environment where he can behave badly. So again, the consequences. If you don't have it, your personal estate will have to settle the outstanding debt. Um, the personal assets normally get sold and they go on auction. And that's where you and I normally go to try to find bargains. You don't want your family home being sold as a bargain to someone to pay off debt for a company that you don't own anymore. Cash flow will drive for your spouse. The chances are you'll never recover the business and the money back from the business and your estate could be declared insolvent. Guys, we're going to have a little quick stand up and stretch because we've got one more thing to cover and then we are done. I'm just going to cover a little bit about exit strategy and then we finish. We've got a little hamper here. It's a heads or tails. So you need to just stand. You can stretch your bones a bit. Have a little groan when you get up. I was chatting to some of the guys earlier when I walked in downstairs at the lift. We've got the board up and they've got Kusatu, Quattro and Police. I was thinking this is going to be a flipping interesting breakfast today. Huh? <laughs> Don't know what's going to happen. You need to move fast before they start chanting next door. Okay, so heads or tails? You're going to choose your head or your tail, okay? If you're wrong, you sit. And then the last person standing will get the hamper. And no and no one from Quattro can win. Sorry, only guests. So Quattro people, you may as well sit down now. All right, heads or tails? Okay, we've got a tail. All the heads sit, please. Heads or tails? We've got a head. All the tails sit, please. That was quick. Heads or tails? Okay, we've got three heads. We need someone with a tail. Okay, tail. We've got two tails, one head. We have a head. Well done. Congratulations. Here we go. All right, designing an exit strategy. As I said at the beginning, the first thing you contemplate when you start a business is how you exit. Okay. Now, we spoke about voluntary exits and, and, and involuntary exits. The first question we need to find out is, is your business saleable? Some businesses are built around a person, an individual, okay? For example, Craig, he's in the dentistry industry, okay? They deal with dentists. Now, my dentist and me, we've got a special relationship. I've mentioned quite a few times. If he hurts me in the chair, I'll wait for him in the parking lot, okay? We will have an altercation. But I trust him, so he's my dentist. He can't sell me. 
when he dies or gets disabled, I'm going to find a new dentist that I like and trust. My architect, he draws pretty pictures for me that I like, and I like him. We get along well. In fact, my architect is George's architect too. He bought a house for both of us in 2001. So we went a couple, by the way. Sorry, we bought two houses next to each other. With an interesting door. Yeah, don't stop it. So, um, but he draws pretty pictures for us. When he dies or gets his own, he can't sell me to someone else. I'm going to find the next person who draws pretty pictures that gets along with me and understands me. Then you've got another type of business, which is a fully functional retail or wholesale or manufacturing business. It has got lots of depth, lots of management. And if the owner dies, there's a succession plan. The business can carry on running. But what we need to find out is, is the business saleable or not? If it's not saleable, is to how to make it saleable. So my dentist, his name was Dr. De Beer. Not De Beer, Dr. De something. I've been there for a while. Anyway, what he did was, he was a dude and he retired. When I went to his rooms the one day, his son was there. And his son came in and put me down in the chair. And the dentist said, please just give Gary a little bit of a clean and all of its pieces. I did those little bits and pieces there. The dentist checked inside. He said, all right, John, let's do some x-rays. He let the son do the x-ray while he sat and watched. And he looked at the x-ray, checked it out. OK, cool, yeah, we need to do this. Cavity here, drill there, quay this, quay that, whatever. Sits down. I'll just put the anesthetic in. So the son puts the anesthetic into my, my gum. And then he does his drilling and all the bits and pieces. And then he asks him to mix all that funny stuff together. The place cut, does it, puts it in. As it feel? No, it's a bit rough. Okay, cool. Go and rinse. Come back. Rinse. Then the sun would polish it. Come back. Sit. Feel now. Smooth. And that kind of pull off you go. The next time I came, sat down in the dentist's chair. The sun does everything. So I was checking this, checking that. The dentist just oversees the stuff. The dentist looks at the x ray, talks to the sun what to do. The sun drills and does an uh, anesthetic. The sun took over. Over three appointments, the next appointment, my dentist was gone. But he had transferred the relationship and the trust with the son to me. So it ended up the son became my dentist. Okay. An architect needs to do the same. A lawyer might need to do the same. So we try and put a strategy in place for non saleable businesses. Some businesses you just can't sell. If you can't sell it, don't put it in your retirement plan because then you just, I always use the analogy of a surfer. Okay. And please excuse the language, but it works for me. Okay. The energy of a surfer. It's winter, it's cold, and you're going out for a surf at that line. What's the first thing you do in winter if you want to surf? Put on a wetsuit. Okay? Then the water gets in and it keeps it warm. If you're still cold, what the boys do is they wee in their wetsuits, just so you know. Okay? You've got a husband who surfs, he wees in his wetsuit. And it makes him warm. So he feels all nice and warm and fuzzy. But the truth is he's pissing on himself. Okay? <laughs> and that's the same with your business. If you think you're going to sell your business at retirement and it's not saleable you're pissing on yourself okay <laughs> so don't do that okay we need to find out uh, sorry corporate to buy or too big for an individual to buy very important things to contemplate okay who is going to be the buyer and how they're going to pay is your business if it's saleable is it affordable is it attractive? If your business is one that can be sold, you need to start trying to decide who the buyer is and start putting plans in place now so they can afford to buy it in the future. Or if you're going to be selling to another competitor or something else, start identifying these people and actually constructing a plan around it, building relationship, whatever it might be. Okay, that's very important. But the one thing we don't want to do is make your life, your business a life sentence. Now, one of the biggest shortcomings we've seen in those, remember those three agreements I spoke about, the buy and sell, the shareholders, and the MRI, the MOI. You need a dividend policy written in to your contract, into your shareholders agreement. Because if you can't sell your business and you retire, you're no longer an employee. You don't get selling. Now you've got the remaining shareholders that are younger than you running the business. You're going to be relying on a dividend, a share of profit, Okay, so that you can live off of it. So now you're having an asset with 10 million rand, but it's not paying you a return on your investment of the 10 million. But then you may as well just sell it and buy something else, put it in the bank, or do whatever you want to do with it. So you've got to make sure that you get a return indicative of the investment amounts. So dividend policy is, is drafted. And as an example, it could say, 
The company is going to grow. So you want to retain some of the earnings in the business to grow the company. But at the same time, you're going to distribute half of the profits or a third of the profits to the shareholders in the form of a dividend. Now you can say, when I retire, I'm going to keep my company. I'm going to retire. I've got a succession plan to run, but I'm guaranteed an income stream coming in. That will form part of your retirement plan. But if you don't have a dividend policy, what happens? You get to retirement age, you retire, and everyone else takes salaries bigger than they were before, bonuses bigger than they were before, retain all the earnings, and then when you come and say, I need some money, they go, sorry, there's no money to pay out. We actually grow this thing. We're young. We want to grow this thing to a monster. So we actually buy more equipment, more machinery, employ more staff. And you go, well, that's great. I'm glad you're growing it. My asset value is getting bigger, but I actually need to buy bread and milk. I need food. I need money. I need a dividend. And here's a dividend policy for you. So now it's a negotiation. So be careful about that. Retirement planning. I often have people say to me, I don't believe in retirement annuities. Well, I didn't believe in the Easter Bunny or the Tooth Fairy at some point in my life either, but I've never found one. But I actually managed to find a retirement annuity because I bought one. So retirement annuities are a very, very important component, particularly for a business owner. If you work for a big corporate, you'll have a pension fund or a provident fund in place where you're forced to contribute towards it. But when you're a business owner or self-employed individual, you're not forced to do anything. You are your own judge, jury, and executioner. So you elect to invest or not. Now, the reason why we need to have a retirement annuity in place is we need to have what we call a have-to-have plan. The have-to-have plan is, when I retire, I don't want to live in a granny flat. I don't want to live off my children. In fact, your children don't want you to live off them either. Okay? I want to be financially independent. I do need a car when I retire. And so does my wife. We get along for four hours a day. From five till nine. Nine, I go to sleep because I have to. Or I'll kill her. Okay? Or she'll kill me. So marriage is a four-hour relationship, not longer. Okay. When it's 24 hours a day, when you do, when you are retired, you're going to stand in each other's places. Get out the house. This is my domain. Go and do your thing. I've got a friend of mine, Costa. He retired early at 56. He was with Nampat. Took his package. I sat down with him the one day. It was like three, four years into his retirement. He says, Gary, you won't believe it. When I used to play golf, my wife used to shit on me for playing golf. She says, now, she tells me to go play golf all the time. You need two cars when you retire. So you've got your own independence. You need a medical aid. You need food. You need lights. You need water. A lot of people think when they retire that they are expense free. You're not. You might be debt free. And please, dear Jesus, may the children have their home money. Okay? But you are still living a life with expenses. Nothing's for free. You can't even go window shopping at Gateway for free because they charge you for parking. Okay? So you need money. So what we do is, in your pension fund, your provident fund, or your retirement annuity, we plan your have-to-have plan. That is... When I retire, I have to have a minimum of X. Let's pretend it's 40,000, just as an example. I have to have 40 grand. Why? I need two cars, but they will be paid off, but I need fuel for both cars, I need insurance for both cars, insurance for the house, lights, water, levy, medical aid, food, some clothing, and a little bit of spending money. Just some dignity and not depend on my kids. Fantastic. We plan that in your have to have plan because if your business goes belly up, You'll get liquidated, sequestrated, flipping, whatever you hate it you want to get. I don't know what sequestrated meant when I was younger, when I started. I thought it was when they cut your balls off, but it's not, apparently. Um, but sequestrated, you have total protection in your retirement plans. They're actually protected by law from creditors. No one can touch that money. Plus, it's fully tax deductible, and your growth is totally, totally tax-free. You cannot beat that investment anyway. Bring anyone to the table with any product. They cannot debate that a retirement annuity is more expensive or worse than any other investment product. It is designed specifically for retirement. It would be as ironic if you bought something else as someone who was a farmer buying a Golf GTR to put a plow on to plow his fields instead of a tractor. 
A tractor is a tool used to pull a plow for a farm. A retirement plan is used as a tool for retirement plan. It's designed for retirement plan. Then you have your aspirational plan, your want to have plan. This is where you can have additional properties, share portfolio, whatever you want to have, business interests and the likes. I would like 100,000 a month as my want to have plan, but I need at least 40. So if the proverbial hits the fan, I've got 40, but if it doesn't, I can get 100. Then we go and play with all the other stuff that you want to do, collect the cars or whatever it is you want and you want to have that. But you do need both. Now, a lot of insurance salesmen send you retirement annuities till you blue in the face. We don't. We construct a plan with that in mind as well as that in mind. We understand that South African entrepreneurs think out the box. We know that there's the saying, the old saying, a board market plan. The problem is, the South Africans are always looking to make a plan and sometimes they don't see What's actually right in front of them? They're so busy looking at alternative things. When when you start hearing people talking about offshore structures, offshore trusts, offshore this, offshore that, run them out. Because if you haven't started this, then you're in the wrong space. Okay. I was going to show you why savings are so important and how quickly you've got to get there. In 1970s, you could spend a thousand rand and you could buy a brand new VW vehicle. In 1980, you bought a motorbike. So if you went to work, you'd be dry. Be noisy, but you'd be dry. In 1980, you'd get wet and cold if it was raining. In 1990, you'd have to buy a bicycle. So you'd be late. Tired. Yeah, late, wet, cold, and tired. Yeah, really not lacquer. In 2010, you'd have to have a pair of running shoes for the same 1,000 bucks. So you have to run to work, you'd be very late. And then in 2020, you could buy yourself a pair of compression socks. So that's how inflation has eroded the buying power of money over time. Now, people like my parents never had people like us going around educating them about inflation. Inflation was a misnomer. But if you look at uh, inflation today and how it worked out, it's frightening. My mom and dad bought the house for 21,000 Rand in 1971. 21 Rand. They took a bond. The bond was massive. If you equated the 21,000 Rand bond in today's terms, would probably cost you about 200 bucks a month. But my dad was probably earning 800 bucks a month in those days. So as part of his salary, it was massive. It was this big elephant in the room. If I said to my dad, Dad, listen, don't pay your bond off so fast, because you just want to get this bond right. Plan for your retirement property. Just leave your bond. Because remember, the bond payment is level. It only increases or decreases if interest rates change. It doesn't go up every year 10%, like your savings needs to. About it to just leave your bond. Just pay the 200 bucks. Because when you get to retirement age, you'll be earning 60,000 Rand a month. And 200 Rand will be nothing. It will be the same as your bank charges. You would have laughed in my face. About said to my dad, 21,000 house okay, will not buy me car tires for my Land Rover. He would have laughed at me. It's nearly 5,500 Rand per tire nowadays for a car. And they were paying 21,000 for a house in 1971. The message I want to uh, say to you is this. My dad's pension fund, when he bought his house, was with McCarthy's, was 600,000 Rand. My dad thought he was getting the equivalent of 28 houses in cash when he retired. But with inflation, when he got paid out, he got 640,000, and he got 2,000 turn around a month pension which didn't even cover a quarter of the medical aid, just because they never planned for inflation. So please, guys, you've got to save as much as you can. This is how inflation impacts on you. A 35-year-old today who wants just 20,000 a month in his have-to-have plan, not the want-to-have plan, just 20 grand a month in his have-to-have plan, which is very low, when he turns 65. So bearing in mind, he's got 50 years to do this, okay? 30 years until he retires. At 65, that 20,000 Rand, will, he will need 152,000 to buy him 20 grand for the stuff. That's just a straight mathematical equation of 7% increase every year. Inflation rate. Now, I don't know where you live, but for me, nothing goes up even at 7%. My medical aid goes up at 8 or 9%. My child's education goes up at 11%. My, my lights went up 
about 600 percent this month but normally 50 percent or 30 percent a year um so Woolworths doesn't go up at seven percent but we as an industry use seven percent as a guideline for inflation and it changes but 152 grand to earn you enough money to buy 20 rands worth of stuff in the 65 look at 85 it's 600 thousand rand a month so i'll urge you to talk to your family friends colleagues kids whatever and just remind them about inflation and they better start saving now because this person needs 29 times more than what they think they're going to get so i have a client who says i'll save two grand a month my retirement and i go listen i'm a financial strategist i'm not a magician that's in the other room okay i can't give you something from nothing okay your retirement contribution, you actually need to feel it. It must actually hurt you. Oh, shit, I paid my premium towards my retirement. During COVID, people were trying to cut their expenses, okay? And a lot of them reduced their RAs. Retirement annuity or retirement savings is not an expense. People think of it as an expense. It's not. Your short-term insurance is an expense. But saving for retirement is taking money out of one bank account and putting it into another for another day. You haven't lost the money. You haven't spent the money. It's in a different pocket, in a different wallet for your retirement. So don't ever, when you cut the expenses, look at your retirement. Okay. This is the last slide. If you're 30 years old, you've got 420 paydays until you retire. If you're 35, you've got 360 deposits that you can put into your piggy bank and you are on pension. If you're 40, you've got 300 deposits, and that's it. Done. You can't go back at 65 going, ah, oh, let's start again. No mistake. Sorry. Um, where's Marty? Can we go back to the future, please? Okay. It's not going to happen. And then 50, you got 180. So, guys, a lot of people get to a point where they go, it's not worth saving for a talent anymore. It is. It's absolutely important. Because if you don't save for a talent, you're actually paying extra tax. If I earn 10,000 rand a month, just as an example, and my salary is taxed at 30%, I would normally pay 3,000 rand a month tax, which would give me 7,000 left over. If I invest my 7,000, if I take 1,000 of it and invest it somewhere, anyway, I'd have six grand to go shopping with. You with me? Left over. So I've got 10 grand, less three grand tax, less 1,000 rand saving, I've got six grand left. If I use that thousand rand in the retirement annuity, what SARS would do is actually charge me less tax. They would give me 30% of my contribution back immediately up front. So I'd end up getting a salary for 10,000. My tax would only be 2,700 rand, not 3,000. I'd have 6, 000, 6, 7,300 rand in my bank account, not seven. I would save 1,000 in my RA. I would then have 6,300 rand left over to go shopping with, not six. I'd have 300 rand more than you, plus I've saved 1,000 rand into an investment that no one can touch, protected from predators, getting tax free growth. There's no other investment in the world that gives you tax free growth, unless you buy Bitcoin, maybe, until you get caught. Um, tax free growth, and it's designed specifically for my retirement. It basically says you are guaranteed a 30% return on day one if you pay 30% tax. If you pay 40% tax, you guarantee a 40% return on your money immediately before growth, just because SARS is getting 40% of your money given back to you as a tax reduction. It's upfront, it's done and dusted, plus you still get the growth. So don't be fooled. If someone argues with you about a retirement plan, phone me. Because they're, they're uneducated. Okay. Guys, that's my story for today. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you learned a little something. As I said, this topic is a hell of a lot bigger than what we discussed today. This is just a very short overview of what we do as strategists for you. And um, if you'd like any questions answered, the floor is now officially open. Anything. I don't know the answer, I'll just pretend it. All right. Well, I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Thank you for listening. We do many of these breakfasts on all different topics. 
we pay for you to come. If you'd like to invite friends, colleagues, family for the next ones, you're most welcome to do so. We'll pay for them to come too. You can have all put them table, you can have all room if you want to. Um, if you've got a group of employees that you'd like us to speak to and educate them, we'll gladly do it. If you give us the topic, a day, and a facility, we will find one for you. We'll host them or host you and um, hopefully get them on track. But our, our main objective, guys, is to educate people so they can start understanding what they need to be doing in their lives to make their financial dreams come true. If you have anyone that you'd like to put on the list, just chat to your advisors um, and they'll be able to um, refer you to Roxanne for the next invitation. But thank you very much. Thank you.